Hi, I'm Tom Landon. The program you're about to watch was recorded live at the historic Granite Theater in Roanoke. Since we started the Echo Channel, we've made every effort to record as many Hoot and Holler storytelling shows as we can. If you appreciate seeing programs like this one and the fact that we make them available online and on demand to a global audience, I hope you'll consider supporting Blue Ridge PBS by becoming a member. These programs aren't cheap to produce and we're actively seeking underwriting to support the recording, editing, and distribution of Hoot and Holler so that we can continue to make these heartfelt and personal tales available to those who are unable to attend them live. If you'd like to learn more about sponsorship, please drop me a line by email at tlandon at blueridgepbs.org. And enjoy the show. Blue Ridge PBS and Echo present Hoot and Holler, a live storytelling event recorded at the historic Grandin Theater in Roanoke, Virginia. Our next storyteller, first timer, she grew up in the Lynchburg area and has lived in Benton with her two tween daughters for the past five years. She grew up listening to her father's captivating tales, never imagining she would one day follow in his footsteps. But when she discovered the hoot and holler, telling a story on the stage became a bucket list item she gets to check off tonight. Fun fact. During an early foray into marijuana use, she found herself trying to deposit cash through a mobile banking app. <laughs> Take a second and then put your hands together and lean in, brave story, Shannon Dominguez. <laughs> I grew up as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And look, I know that we're not supposed to speak poorly about groups of people based on their religious beliefs, so I want to make it very clear to all of you tonight that I do not hate the Jehovah's Witnesses. A lot of them are great people. And there are some rules and regulations within their organization that can cause serious harm. So I invite you to buckle up and get ready to hear perspective that maybe you haven't heard before. You see, my family became Jehovah's Witnesses when I was three. My mom, my dad, my aunt, my uncle, my grandpa, my grandma. My dad was even an elder in the congregation. Now, if you don't know much about Jehovah's Witnesses, here are three things that you'll need to know in order to understand the dynamics of tonight's story. First, the Jehovah's Witnesses are considered a high-control, high-demand religion. Second, once you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you're discouraged from closely associating with friends or family members who are not Jehovah's Witnesses. And thirdly, they practice shunning. So once you decide, and they call this disfellowshipping, once you decide to get baptized as a Jehovah's Witness, and for me, that was at 16, you're never allowed to change your mind or decide that you don't want to follow all of the rules without reaping the consequences of being completely cut off from all communication. No texting, no calling, no emailing, and no greeting in public. I lived in a very small world, and it was the only world that I knew. And I had been pretty good at following the rules, up until about nine years ago, when I decided to go against everything that I had been taught to believe, and I left my husband. Now, my husband was very controlling. I had a curfew, I wasn't allowed to have a job, and sex was expected daily. And look, we don't hate him either. I mean, he is watching the kids tonight, okay? He's got some trauma. I married him after dating him for only two months when I was 18, and 18-year-old me just wasn't super smart. But eight years and two kids later, I knew that I had to leave because I saw our very young children seeing our dynamics, and I did not want them to think that this was normal or healthy or acceptable behavior. So I went against everything that I had been taught, and I took a risk. 
I borrowed $1,500 and got an apartment for me and the girls in the town of Bedford. I had no job, I had no education. So I got busy applying for jobs, finding childcare, filling out paperwork for food stamps, which is a part-time job in itself. And in, on April 6th, 2015, nine years ago, my youngest was napping in the back room with her sound machine on. And I was cuddled up on the couch with my oldest and we were reading books. When all of a sudden, there was a knock at the door. And it was one of those obnoxious kind of knocks, okay? I grew up a Jehovah's Witness. There are a lot of different kinds of knocks. <laughs> this one, was obnoxious. I open the door, and to my surprise, I see a female police officer. She asks me if John Thibodeau is my father, and I say yes. Now, to give you some background on my father, he wasn't so much of an elder tyrant anymore. Something about him and my mom's divorce had opened something inside of him. He became kinder more patient, more honest with himself, and more aware of others. We were tight because we could be real. And he saw firsthand he was one of the few people who knew what I went through in my, in my marriage. And even though he had been an elder, he supported me in leaving and actually was trying to leave a very unhealthy marriage himself. The police officer informed me that my dad had died. My mind went into total shock. It raced. How did he die? Was it a car accident? Was it a heart attack? She had no additional information to give. Later that day, I would find out that my, da that my dad had died from heartache, heartbreak, and utter hopelessness. He had died by suicide. I still find it difficult to describe just how heavy and complex and intense those next few weeks were. I found myself a shell of a person, completely consumed by grief. But as a single parent, things had to get done, and things got done. Within a month, I got a job as a waitress, I enrolled my kids in preschool, and my food stamps application was approved. Yay. It was hard to do the things, and to be honest, I was a wreck doing them. One time I was at the DMV, and a song came on the radio, and I could not stop crying. Grief was like that for me. It was embarrassing. It would smack me in the face at random times, and usually without warning. During the month that followed my father's death, the elders from the congregations were on my case, encouraging me to return to my husband, reminding me to trust in Jehovah, to read the Bible more, and to meditate more on being a submissive wife. I did not want to go back to my husband. We had been separated for a couple of months, and I was actually starting to feel alive again, even in the wake of my father's death. In fact, I feel like my father's suicide woke me up to actually start living a life that I loved instead of just being told what to do and how to think. I feared... I feared that if I returned to my husband, that little spark of life inside of me could perish and that I could do the same thing that he did and I could not leave my children with the, the pain that I was experiencing. I had to leave, even if leaving meant displeasing God. Now, the Jehovah's Witness teaching is very clear. The only way to break the bonds of marriage and get the elder monkeys off your back is adultery. So in what felt like an attempt to save my own life, I made a deal to sleep with a guy that I waited tables with. Now look, was I curious? <laughs> yes. 
was it all that? No. <laughs> it did, however, break the bonds of marriage, so mission complete. The caveat here is that committing adultery is a sin. So a judicial committee of three elders was formed to interrogate and cross-examine me in order to determine if I was guilty or repentant and if I would be disfellowshipped. I met with these elders in a back book study room of the Bedford Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses where they asked me questions like, did you climax? Did he ejaculate? How many times? My face burned with shame and embarrassment. The room felt hot and stuffy. It was violating, humiliating, and very uncomfortable. Now during some of these meetings, three of the meetings, during some of them I cried and I begged, please don't disfellowship me, not at this time in my life. I'm, I'm going through a divorce and my dad just died by suicide. But at other times, I wanted to know why the witnesses said that God said that spouses are never allowed to leave each other even if staying makes you want to kill yourself. And I wanted to know why they referred to psychology articles as worthless, worldly knowledge psychology articles on abuse. I may have even wondered out loud if the environment that they allow creates a playground for abusers to run rampant. I was found to be unrepentant, and my, my discipline was to be disfellowshipped. So within just a few months, I found myself going through a divorce, grieving the death of my father's suicide, and now losing my entire community. I felt overwhelmed and undereducated and unconnected and very confused. I had spent 26 years giving complete devotion, and just like that, I'm kicked out. I had no choice but to start over, and while a blank slate does hold a certain appeal, I didn't even know where to begin. I started examining all the different parts of myself. Which ones were just stuck onto me based on religion or culture or society or family? Who was I? And this is what I found. I knew that I wanted to be authentic and truthful and vulnerable. I knew that I wanted to think for myself and not just believe what I was taught. I knew that I wanted to learn how to take care of my own mental health and set that example for my children. I knew that I wanted to live a life that we would love, a life that would make us want to live. And so I set out to do just that. While soul searching and waiting tables, a friend of mine said, that an immigration law firm was looking for a bilingual receptionist. And when I was a Jehovah's Witness, I had learned Spanish, so I applied. And to my surprise, I got the job. And from there, another law firm offered me a different position, and another law firm, and another. But I still set out searching for a work-life balance that would help my very broken self, who happened to be a single parent. I'm very happy to share that for the past three years, I've been a nonprofit consultant with Building Beloved Communities. And <laughs> and we offer services to organizations that help sexual assault survivors and homeless youth. And I know what it feels like not to have community. So this work is very meaningful. It's also flexible and remote and gives me that work-life balance that allows me to be present with my children and encourage them to pursue their passions, which are currently cheer and gymnastics and theater, or maybe that's just a drama inside the house, I don't know. <laughs> I never 
ever thought that I would get to live the life that I live today. And through the past nine years, there have been many seasons, some where I am thriving and some where I am barely surviving. I've learned more about religious trauma and how those series of events in 2015 wounded me. I've gotten curious about my own healing and probably watch way too many cult documentaries. I read all the books, not just the ones published by the Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, I don't even read those anymore unless I'm trying to create content for my TikTok account. <laughs> I have developed a sense of self where I even know what my favorite color is. Can you guess? Can you guess what it is? <laughs> I wear tops that are way too low and dresses that are above the knee. But most importantly, my home is full of unconditional love. It has not always been easy, but it has always been worth it to find the pathway forward. In fact, now I view myself like a weed, and not the kind just smoke to get you feeling good, but the kind that just won't stop coming back. <laughs>